So there's this idea that some programmers are inherently 10 times better than others, that they generate 10 times as much code, and that having one of these leak code interview processes, that you can find those people and you can fill up your company with just 10x developers. And that's complete bullshit. This is the Internet of Bugs. My name is Carl, and today we're talking about the myth of the 10x programmer. So to start with, I need to explain there are different kinds of programming. There are actually a lot more differences than what I'm about to describe, but there are a few, for purposes of this discussion, categories of programming. And this will probably come up in future videos. Subscribe if you want to see those, but let me kind of give you the categories that are relevant for this. First off, there's scientific or research type programming. It's about discovering something, getting the answer, and then throwing the code away because the code never really mattered. Whether that's you know, some new scientific discovery or look, we got this new algorithm or that kind of thing. The code isn't the point, the answer is the point. Then there's what I call toy programming, one-off puzzle stuff, leap code, interviews, that kind of thing. Then there's project-based programs. The idea is to build the thing and then move on. Back in the old days, this is what most programming was. They would get a group of programmers together, they would build a thing, and then some of those programmers might be in the next group of people that they got to build a thing. There's a great book called The Mythical Man Month, and it was conceived during one of these projects, and that was mainly about what it's about. It's also the context in which Agile and Waterfall were kind of conceived, I guess. This is the kind of work I do, which is why I interview so much, because I don't stick around at a company for a long time unless the thing that the company does changes a lot. I'm a build a thing and then move on to the next thing. I'm not going to sit and maintain a code base for years and years. It's just, it would drive me crazy. But that means a lot of times I'm done with what I wanted to do there and it's time for me to move on. And that's why I have so much more time consulting and interviewing than most people. Even when I'm working at a consulting company, a lot of times the client wants to have an interview. It's a different kind of interview process. It's a lot easier, but I still do end up in lots and lots of interviews. So next type of programming is kind of the most common these days, at least from a job standpoint. There's the corporate staff full-time, you know, we have a bunch of people, we need to keep up coming up with stuff to make, keep them busy kind of programming. It's the standard, you know, take a ticket, fulfill a ticket, that kind of thing. The other kind of programming, the last one I'll talk about, is a weird corner case where you have a tiny, tiny group, often just one person, and that group is pretty much all technical and they conceive of the idea themselves and they build the thing themselves. This is where most of the anecdotes come from. The idea of, you know, here's a person who's so much more productive than anyone in the rest of the world. The, you know, John Carmack, at the first version of Doom, the guy that wrote Linux, John Blow is called out like this a lot of times. All the games are kind of a different thing. In my opinion, the main thing about those groups, those kinds of programming, that's survivor bias. So lots and lots and lots of people form these little technical enclaves or build a project all by themselves. The vast majority of those, no one cares about. Some of those get crazy popular and people ascribe a crazy amount of value to them because they're crazy popular. And I would argue that if you took the people that did those things and you put them in a standard corporate job taking tickets and writing stuff, they wouldn't necessarily be much more productive than anybody else. I haven't done that experiment hopefully we'll never have to do that experiment because that would be a waste of some of their talent. But things that apply in the, I'm building a thing for me and oh look, it became really popular. Those kinds of things don't apply in the kind of world where people do leak code interviews. So the toy programs, the toy programming, that's where the original idea for the 10X programmer came from. They would give people these puzzles, puzzle programs, write a graph algorithm to solve a maze, that kind of garbage and then they would give them two hours to solve it. Some people didn't solve it, and of the people that did solve it, the people that solved it the fastest solved it 10 times faster or more than the people that took the longest time to solve it. That, I would argue, doesn't translate into corporate productivity. I'll, I'll link the, the original study in the description, and I'll also just link a, a modern version of that where they did several different tasks, and they graded everybody on, had the group do all of several different tasks, for each individual task, they still saw a lot of variation, 
but when you average across all of the different tasks, most of that 10x stuff goes away. It happens on one individual task over another, but if you have 10 tasks and you take the average of 10 tasks, there's very little evidence that there's a 10x multiplier or you know, much of a multiplier at all. When you're doing those, those tests, a lot of times somebody will get stuck or something, and in a two-hour window, it doesn't take long to get stuck to make the people that actually got it done faster look so, so much better. What happened in the 90s and 2000s, the cult of trying to find the magic programmers that I talked about in my last video, that was largely fallaciously applying the learnings of the single toy program measurement and the survivor bias of little technical teams that happen to become crazy popular. When you take the lessons from those things and you believe that those apply to corporate programming and you try to use that to fill up your company with only people that are that productive, you end up with garbage, which is how we ended up with this leet code thing, at least a big chunk of it. So there are some truths behind the myth, that said. There are definitely 10x tools and 10x techniques. If you have a much better way of doing something, then it's quite possible you can be 10x faster than somebody that doesn't know that technique or have that access to that library. There are people that argue with that. Um, I would say if you don't believe me, uh, find a programmer friend and challenge them to a race to see who can first write a program that will send a string to OpenAPI as a prompt and then get their response back from the ChatGPT server and print it out on the console. Your friend gets to use Python and pip and you get bare GCC, no package manager, and your choice of either VI or Emacs. I wish you luck. I bet there's a pretty good chance that you're not gonna be able to get it done in a tenth of the time that your friend does, because all they have to do is use PIP to pull a library in. It is the case that if you hire someone who has knowledge of or access to tools or techniques that wouldn't be available if you hired somebody else, you might see a big difference, but that gets normalized across your whole company, and theoretically, everybody that you hire, anything that they know that's special, hopefully will get promoted across the company and become part of the standard way that everybody does things. And then the delta between those people aren't important anymore. And a lot of those things that people know that they can teach other people that make other people more productive are like the kind of things you learn in books or you read academic papers or that kind of thing. So for the most part, that's not information that isn't available. It's just information that no one's bothered to try to read or or learn. It is the case that there are a few people, uh, maybe a lot of people, who refuse to learn new techniques, and so that doesn't help them because they don't want to. They want to do things the way they've always done them. Um, I would argue they're in the wrong line of work because our jobs are constantly changing. They certainly can make the other people look 10x by comparison. This series, I'm specifically talking about interviewing and I'm talking about hiring. So you know, I'm only talking about kind of corporate jobs. I'm not really talking about the little id software in 1990s kind of teams. I'm talking about just large companies or even medium-sized companies kind of thing. I'm explicitly ignoring job types like, you know, founder of a startup that aren't actually being hired for. So the rest of this essay, I'm going to be focusing on just corporate programming or startup programming that has investors because the incentives there are more or less the same. In a company or on a team where We've already decided what the goal is. The tools and techniques have already been pretty much defined, which is the context in which most of the leak crap coding interview stuff happens. I don't believe there can be a 10x developer in that kind of process. One developer can't be 10 times more skilled than somebody else. But let's ask the question a different way. Is it possible that a team member can be one tenth or one one hundredth of the most common level for a team member for that level of experience? Absolutely. It happens a lot, but that's not a skill issue. Consider the median team member, so the most common level of productivity across your whole company for a given band, for a given number of years of experience with the set of tools, right? And don't worry about the idea of what productivity means. Just go with your gut. How we measure productivity is a whole different problem, but don't worry about that at the moment. My experience says that given the same tools and techniques, roughly the same number of years of experience, the same number of years or months of experience with the given set of tools and techniques, the most productive person in your company might be maybe 20% more productive than the most common level for that level of experience. But there are lots of people in a big company, and often some people in medium or small companies, that are way, way below the median. And so if you take the, the low performers and you measure them against the highest performers, you might see a 10x difference, but it's not about the high performers, it's about the low performers. And in my experience, this is not a skill issue. If it was that kind of skill issue, right, if you had somebody who was that far below what your 
average common skill level for that number of years of experience is. To anybody who had interviewed more than a handful of people, you wouldn't need a coding test. You could just talk to them about the kind of stuff that they'd done before and they would stick out like a sore thumb and you would know that they didn't know what they're talking about. If you can get through a simple, tell me about the kinds of code you've written kind of conversation and sound halfway intelligent, then you're not gonna be at that very, very bottom level from a skill standpoint. When you've got those people that are so much less productive than everybody else or than the most common person, that's a management issue. And I don't mean they need to get beat up on and they need to get written up. I mean, their manager sucks. Maybe they're, they don't get along with their manager. Maybe they're being bullied or belittled. They could be afraid for their job. Maybe they don't like what they're doing. Their incentives don't line up with what the manager wants the team to do. The expectations of what they're trying to do aren't clear to them. Maybe they've already started looking for another job and they're checked out. The largest factor of employee performance is how good the manager is. And note that a manager can be, the same manager can be bad for one employee and great for another. It's a function of how they get along and how, what the individual employee wants relative to what the group is trying to accomplish. Expectations, motivation, and incentive alignment are the most important things. That doesn't mean there's no difference between someone from like the very top of their class or the scored the very best on the interview and someone from the very bottom of the class. But the work output between the person that did best on the interview or the valedictorian of their class and someone who just barely, barely squeaked by is many, many times smaller than the difference between either one of those people and what those people would be performing like in the event that they had a manager that hated them and that they hated. If you've got a person working for a manager that's not helping and it's not doing what they need to have done by their manager, or worse, actively making things worse, then that employee is going to be way, way down at the bottom, but it's not a skill issue and it's not a thing that leak code interviewing would have identified. But if a company is doing a bunch of leak code interview, then what they're doing is they're actually making their candidates miserable as part of the interview process. And when companies say that that leap code interview process is very, very important and that they want to make sure that they go through that process because it makes for employees that perform better, I think that what they're actually saying is our managers are really bad and our environment is miserable. And we're trying to select for people with the temperament to perform well, even when they're being miserable. And if that's their situation, and I think for most of the big tech companies, for most of the groups it is, they could be correct in that selecting for people that perform well when they're being made miserable intentionally makes a big difference in how well those people perform and how long they stay. And that fits with how bad turnover is at a lot of those companies. They're actively making people miserable and chasing them away and people leave. And so if that's the work environment you've got and that's the work environment you're trying to interview people to be in, maybe doing leak code and trying to make them miserable on the way in is not the worst idea. <sighs> but if that's where you are, I feel sorry for you. So if your company has a good working environment and people support each other and your managers are good, then that leak code crap just chases good candidates away. If big companies force you to do it, that's one thing. But if you can get away without doing it, you're going to get a much better quality of candidates. In the last video I did on interviewing, I mentioned that the best performing teams I ever worked with didn't need to do leak code crap because they weren't afraid to let people go if they didn't work out. And so that gave them a lot more flexibility in, in not having to worry about whether or not the people they hired could program because it turned out they couldn't after the fact. They could let them go. What I didn't mention is that, as far as I remember, no one ever on any of those teams got let go for skill reasons. We did have, I mean, there were little companies, some of them were startups. Yes, there were layoffs. There was one particular person that didn't show up to work fairly often for presumably personal reasons, and he ended up getting let go. That was not a skill thing. The code he checked in when he bothered to show up was actually great. It, it was not a skill issue. I don't ever remember actually having a skill issue even for a little while with any of the people on any of those teams. So the idea of having that we're willing to let you go kind of mentality, I want to make sure I'm clear that that didn't mean we hire a bunch of people and just let a bunch of people go because they didn't meet our standard. We never really had to. In my opinion, which is probably pointless, but in my opinion, if these big companies actually wanted to be more productive, instead of spending so much effort trying to screen all of their interviewees and all their candidates and putting all the effort into this lead code process thing. They would have much better results if they actually tried to focus on good managers instead of only hiring super skilled programmers. Two problems with that. First, managers as a whole almost never want to create or be part of a process that holds managers responsible for anything. And two, 
managing well is really hard. And finding good managers through an interview process is like, I have no idea. I think I have a pretty good track record about identifying and hiring technical people. When it comes to hiring managers, I could pretty much flip a coin. I've, I've never had good results to that. I've never figured out what the right questions to, to ask and what answers tell you that someone's going to be a good manager or not. I haven't interviewed nearly as many managers as I have technical people, but I, I, I don't know how to find good managers. And that makes it kind of a problem. Uh, someone in the comments the other day said they wished I could be their manager. I've been a manager. I have been told by some of the people that worked for me that I was a good manager. Probably not all of them would agree with that, but not everybody gets along with everybody. But the times that I was a manager were some of the most very miserable times of my life. And I took a big pay cut to go back to being an individual contributor for a reason. I just, I don't have the temperament to be a manager. Um, I care too much about the people underneath me and that doesn't go over well in a lot of environments. Maybe I'll talk about that someday in some video if people really want to hear that. So that's the trick. If you have good managers, then you don't need leak code. And stop looking for 10x developers. Focus on good development managers because you can have much better success getting good managers than trying to chase the mythical programmers that don't actually exist. Not that that could happen, not at scale. The bigger the company gets, the harder it is to maintain a good management structure. I made a whole video about how the worst problem in tech is not AI. It's when hype and stock buybacks and not supporting your employees and, and announcing layoffs seems to result in, in better outcomes for upper management and better stock prices than, than actually trying to do a better job of making products and being productive. It's really hard to keep good managers. There's just, there's no incentive for them to be good managers. I know there are good managers in those companies, but there's very little incentive to stay that way. So in my experience, over time, the median manager at a big company just trends toward being awful. What that does mean is that a smaller company with a smaller management team and the ability to have everybody motivated to achieve the same goal and good managers has a huge productivity advantage over a big tech company. And they can be very productive and come up with great innovative products which is why those companies, when they have their products become popular, get bought by the big companies, and then those products go to crap. And now we're back to where we started with big companies with lousy managers getting results from a miserable interview process because it best selects for people who can handle the miserable working environment. And this is one of the main reasons why the internet has so many bugs. That's it for today. Let's be careful out there.